Hello, everyone. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 8 of Personal Deck Tech. Uh, we're talking Odd Mage in Wild with Reno Jackson. Uh, you know, if you haven't heard of Reno Jackson, he is a wild player, always brings the craziest decks. You may have known him from the Wild Open, or you may have known him from his crazy outfit that he wore to the Wild Open. But I will let him talk a little bit more about himself. Reno, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks, Consanity, for having me. So, um, yeah, my name is Daniel, but people know me on Twitter as Reno Jackson. Yeah, the, the wild card, which is kind of fitting, you know, because I only play wild mode. So you can just call me Reno. It's the person's name anyways. Did, did, you, uh, did you start playing when Reno was around? Yeah. No, I started playing way before that. So I started playing in around next Ramas. So mm-hmm. I would say I'm quite, I'm quite a veteran. Anyways, my friend introduced me to this game. And the funny thing is that he played it for another two weeks and then he quit the game and wow. left me to play it alone. Wow. But I don't, yeah, I don't mind much. I kept playing the game and it's been treating me well. But, well, I used to have a different battle tap before Reno Jackson, but I, I didn't remember what it was. But then uh, League of Explorers got released and I really liked it the card so i just changed my name to that um you know what what were like okay so you started playing a naxxramas um yeah at what point did you really start taking the game seriously and, and finishing high on legend and you know being pretty much uh like a pioneer of that format um i think the f- the first time that i've ever gotten legend was before the split so there wasn't there wasn't any standard there wasn't any wild then so I reached legend with Tem- Temple Mage back when Flame Wicker was a thing. Well, it's still a thing now, but okay. <laughs> it hasn't <laughs> been a thing for a long time. So I just started hitting legend then, and then I just kept going, you know, once I got a hand. <clears throat> yeah, I, I got used to the thing and just kept going, hit legend almost every single month. But then the, s- the split happened, and I I thought to myself that you know, if I have access to every single card in the format, why should I play standard? You get what I mean? Yeah. So I just yeah. played WoW since then. Uh, did you, you know, how was it like when the split happened for you? Like, did you find that it was harder to queue games for Wild or was there always like people playing Wild? And <laughs> It's always been hard queuing games in Wild, you know, you have to wait at least five, ten minutes sometimes, especially when it's when it's night in America, mm-hmm. because uh, I used to I used to play on Asia server. So, uh, it's the same thing when it's two three a.m. on Asia, then it's nobody really playing, yeah. and you the tick, yeah the queue just take forever, and it's it's always been a problem, still a problem now, especially with the new patch coming out. You can't really queue into the same person anyways uh, oh. anymore. I mean, in in Wild, there's only there's always only two people playing so if you can't queue into them there's nobody else that's crazy i mean i mean that's for you i because you are like you know you float around the top 100 yeah, top like legend. top 10 like it's, i mean it must be crazy for you yeah but, um, i'm not man, too sure wild. if this it gets any better if you're lower down the line you know oh it gets but better I think, but yeah because I, I you know i'm like you know i'll hit legend but i won't be like top 100 or anything like yeah. that and i i was i was fine matches but yeah like it it is queuing up into the same person pretty often, but I think that I think that's interesting though. I think it it offers like you know counterplay, yeah, yeah kind of different. And stuff. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Uh, what is your favorite archetype of all time? Um, I'm a big fan of uh, warrior, a control warrior in particular, or any fatigue strategies. So I just love looking at the pop up saying that. You're taking 10 death for deep damage, and then they die with no cards mm. left on hand and, or in, in the deck, you know? Yep. So, like, decks that people find boring, stuff like Dead Man's Hand Warrior, or like Odd Warrior, kind of nice for me. Uh-huh. So, you like the long games? Yeah. Or, well, I, I usually like to, to have them die before turn 5 or after, like, turn 3, so there's no in between. Oh, wow. Dude, that's two like that's two ends of the spectrum. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. 
But I, you know, like I, I always have an admiration for people who love to play the fatigue decks because, especially if you're grinding mm-hmm. the ladder, like yeah. you really have to be making the right decisions every turn yeah. because if you lose a game that went twenty minutes long or eighteen minutes long or whatever, it's very that, tilting. <laughs> yeah, that can be very tilting. And yeah, I mean, obviously you have to be holding a pretty high win rate with those decks to. Yeah, it is pretty high. Um, are you are you uh, keeping up with any of the Grandmaster? Like, how much of the standard content do you like keep up with? Um, I sometimes tune into uh, play host on Twitch channel mm-hmm. if I if I have the time. You know, I yeah I watched the the host on World Championship last year, and I still watch some of the Grandmaster games. I I know the players who are in the Grandmasters, but like not too much else. So speaking of the Grandmasters, is there, I mean, you know, from what you know, is there a player that uh, you know that you were surprised didn't make Grandmasters maybe? I mean, hard to um, say, right? Yeah, I would say, uh, let me let me just think from the top of my head. Hmm. I would say uh, Feli. You know Feli? The pro no. player from Czech Republic. So he used to be in the Wild Open 2018 from there. Uh-huh. With me as well, and then you just take off there, and uh, he's a friend of mine who happens to play the game very well. So he he's won various tournaments. Uh, I think that he won Euro- European Summer Championship as well. So wow. he almost made it into the World Championship last year, and just I think he he lost in the final round. Okay. So he came very close. He came very close. So I know Europe is a very competitive region, so, but. Yeah. I, for me personally, Ferry definitely deserves a spot. You know, you, you were talking a little bit about you know competitive Hearthstone and Wild. It doesn't really get the support from Blizzard in terms no, of things you can enter. But mm-hmm. luckily, the Wild com- community is pretty close knit. So, I mean, I know it you is. were throwing uh, tournaments on um, what is that uh, platform that you guys are on, um, on Blue Stacks? Blue Stacks, yeah. So they have they have a Discord channel and everything is automatic there. You just you just sign in and then there's a there's an there's a bot that just does everything else for you. So that's not really much to do. What what's that format like? Is it specialist or is it? Oh, the, I can choose the format. So they give me a lot of liberty as to what, as we were to what we can do. So how the, oft, how often do you throw those? Um, happens once a week so the oh. tournament last time was in the conquest format and it's only best of, best of three mm-hmm. with closed deck lists so it opens up opportunity for you know a lot of wow. spicy deck lists so i can i can just change it up switch it up whenever i can so just trying to keep things fresh do you guys have an archive of like the matches that get played there or anything um not really that i know of but we do stream some of the games. Oh. So yeah. So some of the games are pre on streams. Especially well, all the all the semifinals and the finals are always on stream. So if you have access to, I can give you access to the VODs if anybody needs to to look at that. Yeah, we'll put that in the podcast mm-hmm. show notes. So if you guys want to te- check that out. Yeah. As that's well cool. as the Discord, right? There's a Discord channel you'd like these guys to join. Yeah, so I also host tournaments for for Team Brainstar. Mm-hmm. So it happens once a month, but the tournament goes for much longer because it's best of five. And, well, I have to wait for games, and it just takes forever, you know? Yeah, I bet. It, it just happens when one of the brackets moves faster than the other. Mm. I don't know if you've been, been in for that For sure, yeah. Yep. So you yep. have to wait another couple of hours. And, hours that's too long no i mean yeah Nothing if one guy's hours, playing yeah. all controlled lists it's like fuck forever yeah and it just holds up that entire leg of the bracket right like yeah, all the yeah, matches yeah. can't go forward yeah that's the worst like i i also do uh, other gaming tournaments where i come from i live on guam right and um mm-hmm. so i do like fighting game tournaments like uh, street fighter dragon ball things like that and it's then the same uh, thing happening yeah you know like we have a double elimination bracket so like when people oh. are in the losers bracket like, if they're playing multiple games, you know, you have to wait for those other games to finish so that they can finish their loser's bracket game so that yeah, other people can play the loser's bracket matches. That's, like... <laughs> but, you know, the good thing yeah, about those is those games crazy. are, like, ten minutes, right? Like, uh, Hearthstone, oh, right. Hearthstone yeah, thing can take game. fucking an hour. 
you know yeah that's, that's, that's crazy the worst. um you know what are three basic principles you think that people that finish in high legend have that people that are finishing outside of the top i guess 500 in wild uh don't have mm. um i'll say that perseverance is one of them like breaking top legend isn't all that hard it's just this some are not as patient as other so like sometimes you're going to lose and you're going to feel really down but that's just the nature of the game maybe you can come back later then you play better and you ride a good win streak and you find yourself hard enough and but also you need to be mindful of your decisions you need to know what you what to do when you're winning and what to do when you're losing because you'll be playing very differently in such situations so top players know when tempo is more valued and when you need to grind out the tiniest piece of extra values mm-hmm. and but knows about all the micro decisions so like the good enough players know the macro decisions but top player can see the great details and um lastly you have rage management this is a funny one but kind of straightforward you know uh-huh. you don't play well you don't play well when you're angry so like don't oh, be angry when you play <laughs> That's true. Do you have like any rules of thumb? Like if you lose a bunch of games, you're like, okay, I'm just done today or like... Um, Usually I follow this kind of rule. If I lose two games in a row, I'll just come back later, you know? Because uh, I'm a little bit religious when it comes to that. If you... If you hit... If you hit a lose streak the rest of your day, it's just not gonna go well. So you just come back later. You'll be in a better state of mind anyway, so... It doesn't... It doesn't help when you start tilting. Just keep going on. You just, you just, just throw off, throw away all the stuff that uh, you built up until, you, yeah, you built up, up, up until that point, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then you start just playing loose, right? Like you know, just yeah, making yeah. way quicker, rasher decisions. Yeah, yeah, that happens to me a lot. More. Yeah, that's the worst, man. I but um, so, I I mean like, cause you know I I've never finished in the top like 10 legend in wild um mm-hmm. what like how do you gauge your progress with this like halfway through the month like if you're sitting outside 500 or like at 250 are you like okay um i'm on pace here or do you just like play hearthstone every day and just you know hope that you play better as oh. <laughs> as the days go on and, and win yeah I... I don't think I'm that competitive of a player, you know, because so so I don't really set any um say so don't set any goals that I need to to hit this particular rank by uh, I don't know say the first week or so. But the months that I find myself really high are usually the months that I, I hit legend very early. Mm-hmm. So that's part of it as well because when you it's easy for you to 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 get high enough and to stay there then to grind at the end of the season and just have to trot up like 500 ranks now that's yeah. it's not an easy thing to do and you and if you happen to fall down you give yourself time to just crawl back in you know if you yeah. if you just wait until the end of the month then you just have no time to do anything at all and there's a lot more risk involved you know I, I like what you said about um, like the greater players know when to play for the tempo or play mm-hmm. for value, yeah. Um, because it's not it's not always just like that yeah, simple, right? Like you know, yeah. oh, it's control warrior. I'm gonna play for tempo here versus him, right? Like because sometimes you know the hands or the board state dictate something different, right? Um, That's true. Do you find? I know you only play wild, but do you find the variety of decks in wild, like for the different classes, make it difficult? to make those macro type of decisions like mulliganing and i don't know play, deciding to play for tempo early well they say it's been a discussion for a long time that the the players in wild they usually make they usually don't make as many optimal plays as playing standards and i would argue that one of the reasons for that is because there's such a big variety in standard, you know what you're going to queue and you know the popular matchups, so you have a lot of practices against those matchups. Mm-hmm. But in WoW, there's, a, there's too much for you to learn, and I would say it's like impossible to 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 grab of the popular matchups. Yeah, the semi-popular matchups, like 100% sure. So 
It's, and things like this takes a lot of practice. So you would mulligan wrong most of the time if you see something that's not really popular. And I would say that sometimes you just don't really know what to do. Mm-hmm. It happens to me. So it happens to me as well. So it can happen to everybody. You know what? I, I, I like how you, you, you were mentioning like it's very difficult to mulligan against things. And I think that's going to bring us to the next part of this podcast where we talk about the spicy deck list that you brought here. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, the reason why I bring this up is because I, like, when I play Wild, there are three... I only play one deck in Wild right now, and mm-hmm. it's um, the Cyclone Mage or whatever, Quest Mage, Ooh. right? Yeah, I've been playing... I love it. I've been playing that for two seasons. I, I copied the list from a Japanese guy, like, two... Like, I guess mm-hmm. last season, and I... You know, I really like that style of play. I, I think yeah. it's it's pretty fun. There's yeah. tricky lines. There's a lot of RNG yep. involved. But, uh, you know, all games feel winnable, right? Yep. But So it's every like, time you queue into a mage, you feel like this is the deck you're going to face, right? Yeah. But I see, you you. <laughs> I see you have brought something very spicy here. We got an odd mage list. Uh, you guys can copy the deck code in the description. But for those of you mm-hmm. who don't have it, we got two arcane blasts, two arcane missiles, uh, uh, the the fire eater guy. What is that? Burning flame eater, or whatever. Burning uh, fire eater. Yeah, two of him. One mirror image. Two ray of frost. Two black cat. Two cinder storm. Two conjurer's calling. Two flame wakers. Two polymorph uh, boar. Um, uh, Luna. Uh, two unexpected results. That's a card I've like never seen played. Uh, <laughs> two azure drakes. One Lotheb, uh, Archmage Antonitis, two Corridor Creepers, Janelai the Firehawk, and of course Baku. And I'm just going to, before you talk about this deck, I'm just going to say right now, I love this deck because you got four Azure Drakes in it. And I Black <laughs> Cat, you know, my little local thing is a cat. I love cats. Uh, Black Cat is like one of my cool favorite cards, uh, even though I've That's rarely fun. ever played it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what, why you decided to create this thing? Um, so it's like... When, when, when they make back you again, you would know that people are just gonna make decks that revolve around those strategies. So all that's all these decks popped up, things like Art Paladin and like even Shamans and stuff. And then there's just no, no, not really much of the variety. Now when I say there are nine classes that can play Art and even even decks, why don't you why do you only play Shaman? Why you only play Warlock, you know? So I'm just trying to make all these back you and again decks to work. And Automage just happens to be one of the decks that work out the best for me. So that's that's why I made the deck. What What is the game, what is the strategy with this deck? Like, what, what are you looking to do? Um, I think this deck plays a little bit differently against, like, different decks in the format. Like, um, I think it's against faster aggro and mid-range deck, you would like want to fend off the early game before developing a board for yourself. Because if you see from the deck list, I play no one drop. Yeah. So it's not a deck that really goes, just vomits everything on board and just trying to get things going very early. So like, against these kind of decks, you would like to, 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 to fend off the aggression and then you drop something like, Maybe a cheap card or creeper, and just put conjures core on top of it. So it's it's zero mana when you play the creeper, but it's seven mana on board. So wow. you can you oh can get two god. seven drops. Oh my god! As early as turn five. Oh. So that's pretty that's pretty cool shit, you know. Oh gosh, that's so wild. I was just thinking about. It. I was like, okay, yeah, but yeah. So you can conjures creeper, or you can yeah, so conjures calling. Yeah. Ask creeper. me what what is conjures conjures calling doing in that deck, like. You don't have any target for it, no. But no, you're wrong. You do. Yeah. You do have a target. It's just, <coughs> it's just that. Well, it's not mountain giant, so yeah. it's it's not the popular stuff. So you you don't really don't really think about it. So you and, mentioned that the uh, the one drops in the deck they're pretty reactionary, right? Like I, I mean, yeah. So do you keep those versus stuff like if you're expecting Odd Paladin or maybe Odd Rogue? Are you keeping Arcane Missiles or Arcane Blast in those matchups or? Um, really depends. 
obviously again stuff like art pattern you would like a copy of arcane missiles but not two of them though because mm-hmm. well arcane missiles can help you fend off the one one minions for a turn but ultimately you need board so i would keep stuff like flame waker keep mm-hmm. stuff like black cat or crawl or creeper like so it's generally the minions that you can stick on board and then you can couple it up with arcane missiles just to remove their board and devil of something at the same turn so that's generally how it goes against uh against board based aggro decks but against stuff like quest mage i don't know if you want to categorize quest mage as an aggro deck it doesn't really play like an aggro deck mm-hmm. but it's, it's one of the faster decks in in the format so against those decks though you would like to be more aggressive for locking the board with stuff like low tap mm-hmm. so basically be as aggressive as you can Okay. Are you, uh, so how, for unexpected results, like, how, what is the optimal way to play this card? Are you just waiting to um, play it with a black cat, or is it like a tempo play? You go black cat into uh, unexpected results on turn four or something? or Like, well, the, the earlier you can play unexpected results, the better. So if you don't have any other plays on turn three, I reckon you just play it. Because okay. well, generally you have two two drops for three mana, so that be, you'll be looking at and a four five four or five yeah so you'll be looking at four four words of stats four attack power four health mm-hmm, so that's mm-hmm. pretty good even before uh, before the spell damage okay. but if you have black cat or if you have any other one draw two three drop or you just drop it before then or if you suspect that but if you suspect that they're gonna have stuff messes with your spell damage or messes with your well, s- spells in general and you mm-hmm. play it before you play the minions so you play around stuff like low tap yeah. because low tap is a very popular card in in the format right now mm-hmm. so it really depends but in general you would like to play it early because the earlier you get it on board the better how often are you weaving the hero power into turns with this deck i mean it's a baku deck right so you're looking at the buffed up fire blast right um like how often are you using it i was going to talk about this as well because your hero power is very efficient so with the normal hero power you just ping ping one damage off but here with this one you can what ping two damage off well that's self-explanatory yeah well but the thing about the hero power and why it's so efficient in stuff like odd pattern or even shaman is that it creates card advantage so like you don't you don't cost a card when you play it. Mm-hmm. So if you used your hero power instead of using your card to remove a card from your opponent, you're gaining what you essentially you're gaining one card. Yeah. And the other thing about it is that it powers up your channel eye. Yeah. The minion that, well, the seven mana minion summons the Ravnoros with a condition. So I I've had instances where I wished I would have pinged one more time earlier than turn seven, so I can just drop my channel eye. So you things that you would like to use your hero power a lot so to gain those incremental advantage for janela you have to ping the face right or can it you have to pick you you can ping anything oh as, really yeah as long as you deal with eight damage so like oh, if you ping, if you if you ping the shielded mini bot it doesn't count because you're dealing zero damage mm. so don't think that things other stuff but you can do like burning fire eater and ping yeah for, burning like, fire eater that's more damage. damage to the face wow. So you burn, you you use the fire eater twice, mm-hmm. and then it's eight damage already. Crazy, that's crazy. Um, man, you know, like, and I'm still like I said earlier, I really like that there's Azure Drake in here and Black mm-hmm. Cat. Like, just drawing a card with off yeah. of a creature is always always All the feels pretty damage good. Stuff, so. <laughs> how how do you play the matchup versus like Big Priest? Are you mulliganing for like a polymorph boar, or are you just trying to be aggressive? There's two way about it. If you have polymorph four, you just keep it, but don't keep the second one. If you don't have access to it, you just like to be as aggressive as possible. But generally, that's the that's the game plan, anyways. So you'll be looking at if they draw barns on turn four, it has a one-one minion. If you have war, you just spoil. Yeah. But instead, but uh, well, if 
the one one minion, something like Magos or something like uh, Velen, then you can just choose to ignore it. But generally, you just don't want to put stuff in their dead rattle pool. Yeah, yeah. So that's how you use polymorph board. You don't wait for value because, uh, well, if they if you want to resurrect the ball, well, good on them. You know. Yeah. So. You'll be looking at stuff like low tap as well, but I don't recommend keeping low tap mm -hmm. because the problem with this deck is that it can be aggressive, but it struggles to be aggressive. You don't have that many early drops, so if you you're keeping low tap, you're saying to you're saying to yourself that I believe that I'm gonna draw three drop, which doesn't happen to me often. If you see, yeah, it doesn't happen to me often because I don't draw well at all. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, how, how, how about Flame Waker? I mean, like, if if he's the only three drop in your hand, the board is pretty even. Or do you like how often are you tempoing this guy out? In uh, it really depends. Against control, you don't need to gain that much value from your from your early spells because against control, you have this debate whether you want to play your early spells right now and it's gain two extra damage with Flame Waker, or do you want to keep it for stuffs like Antonidas? So I, I reckon you just, against control, just drop it on turn 3 because you have the option to turn your other spells into damage later on. Like but yeah. against against uh, aggro, you would either want to go face very aggressively, so you have, they have to deal with your flame wicker before they develop anything, or you want to hold it off so that your flame wicker with the one mana spells can clear off their board and then they have nothing and you have a board so it really depends on which matchup you're looking at interesting interesting um you know so you just started playing this deck of a few days ago right like yeah i i played it a few months ago as well but that's that was before the buffs so i didn't have stuff like unexpected results but i had quite quite a few like, i would say i have experience with it beforehand so you know when you're testing something something like this at the higher levels of the game um how do you judge what's effective or what's not working with the smaller um, sample size at that level you know what i'm saying it's just i would say that you just have to have a general grasp of it like a general guess because when you play against this deck, for example, I try uh, Luna's Pocket Galaxy, mm -hmm. and I run into stuff like Art Paladin, and it wasn't working out. So I would say to myself, Art Paladin is a representative of the meta. So if if this particular version doesn't beat Art Paladin, would it beat the other similar decks? You get mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I would use that logic to test out the stuff, because, well, <laughs> obviously you don't get to play that many matches and you don't really see that many other decks on ladder so you just have to make an evaluation based on what you see that's the safest best for me so in your in your experience with the deck what are the matchups that you'd love to see and what are the matchups that you're kind of uh, rather you would rather not queue into um i think that this deck has games against most decks in the format but I would really love to see both base decks like Art Paladin or Art Rogue though, because it does very well in fending them off. Also, it's pretty good against Warlocks and uh, well, I don't I don't hate killing into Big Priest and the popular Quest Mage, mm -hmm. but I probably don't like to see Druids and Art Warriors because they can gain a lot of armor and I don't like armor. But I like armor when I'm playing them, but not <laughs> on the other end. Yeah. Well, you can't. You can't really bust them down with this deck. You don't really have that kind of damage as opposed to stuff like Quest Mage. So mm -hmm. if they have answers to all of your threats and to Antonidas, you kind of stuff, you know? Mm. And Antonidas, I mean, like you're typically throwing them down like turn 10 with like a double uh, Ray Ooh. of Frost or something with a that's, Arcane Blast or something? Yeah, that's the common uh, mistake people ah. make. So I think some people are too conservative for dropping their win condition. So for example, some hold Antonidas until they can make sure they get value out of him, as uh -huh. you said, dropping yeah. him 10-10. Yeah. 
but by then you have given your opponents the chance to draw into removals or given away board advantage. So you would have to you have to understand that Antonidas is not your only win condition in this deck. So don't be afraid to stop drop him just to gain foothold when you think that they are unlikely to hold the right removal. So mm. hand tracking is very important here. So you need to track you need to track which card which removals they use and how likely the removals are gonna be in their hands. Hmm. So you see you see the cards they've been keeping for several turns. You can have a general guess as to what that card is, and if you think that that's not the removal, you drop Antonidas. You mentioned that, like, uh, you know, playing him on turn 10 is a common misplay. Are there any other decision making things that are commonly misconstrued with this deck? Um, I guess the same thing goes with other subs like Low Tap or Giant Lie. Mm-hmm. For example, some people just hold low tap to get maximum value out of him. So forgetting that he's at 5-5, five, five, so he's 5 extra damage on board, and he locks the board for one turn in many situations. Yep. So you, with the deck that doesn't really have that much burn as Art Mage, sometimes you really value that 5 that uh, five extra attack. Mm. And, uh, also, some people are wasteful on small spells. So spells like Arcane Missiles and Arcane Blasts gain a lot of value from a Flame Waker, from a Black Cat or Antonidas. So using them too liberally means that you're missing on value. Mm-hmm. So well, you need to know when you want to use the spells. Sometimes you value the damage from Flame Waker more, but sometimes you want to value the extra fireballs. Okay. Dang. All right. Man, well, thank you, man. Thank you for going through this deck list. Like I said, uh, if you no are listening so. <laughs> to the podcast, you can download the deck code and then also, of course, join the Discord. Um, mm-hmm. Reno, any final thoughts, final words that you want to say to people at home? Um, I guess it's, a, it's been a wonderful time hanging out with you on here. So I really appreciate what you've done for the community. So I really appreciate appreciate all the people who will be listening to this podcast. So uh, that's probably it. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Great, man. Um, you know, so, man, what's next for Wild? What is the next big thing going on in Wild that people should know about? Odd Mage becoming tier one. Oh, is that what it is? know about that. Do you write for any of the meta reports? Like, um, oh, I don't know. Yeah, tell- I do. I'm the, uh, I'm the lead war writer for the Rank Star Wild meta report, so it's a monthly thing. Cool. It's. Yeah, the difference between Rankstar and uh, the the other reports that exist in the format is mm-hmm. that we uh, we feature a lot more decks, so we give room for decks that are obscure or that has uh, the decks that have a lot of potential but doesn't but, but don't really have that many uh, pilots. Mm-hmm. What so that, what are some yeah. decks do you think that are going under the radar that this that need to see more play besides this odd mage, obviously. Um, I would say stuff like uh, maybe Treasury Warlock is like one of oh the best gosh. control warlock in existence right now, but not many people have been catching on to it. Maybe it's because of the skill ceiling that yeah. might be a problem, or maybe stuff like um, Hunter. Hunter is very underplayed right now, but there are many good decks. Yeah, I mean, I always see Duin. I always see him posting like crazy wild hunter decks. Mm-hmm. Duins have some spicy decks. Oh, he yeah. used to, yeah, he used to lay out the foundation for the for the spell hunter that I eventually worked on, mm-hmm. and it's been it's been doing very well for me. But also spicy stuffs like I, I may be biased because I made most of these decks, but Hand of Paladin, mm-hmm. you know that stuff. That that's that's some sort of spicy stuff, and it actually got me ranked as high as rank two. Really? On legends, so that's. I think that's it's I mean, pretty that, good on its that's own. That's post buff with the buff to. Uh, yeah, th- with the buff to crystallogy and uh, the glowstone technique. Glowstone, yeah, there you yeah. go. Wow, interesting, man, interesting, man. Well, I am excited to really play this because I know Saucy Mailman always complains about Quest Mage, so I want to uh, cue into one of these guys that hates Quest Mage with Odd Mage, so that they're surprised and. Oh. You know, I. <laughs> I really uh, and you'll be like yeah, you you'll be looking to queue into me then. Oh, uh, I, I hate that deck. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I don't pl- I don't play it ever, but it's just I don't really like the the decks that I don't know just 
uninteractive. So usually you have ways to interact with deck in a win condition, but they're getting an extra turn to do whatever they want when there's nothing you can do to interfere isn't very fun for me. So you don't like all iterations quest mage? Like not even, not just the cyclone mage, but even like older quest mage, the traditional type of quest mage decks out there? Um, I think that older quest mage is fine. Because, well, um, it takes a lot more time than to yeah, take. Yeah, it takes like, like 10 turns, you know? Or like yeah. 9 turns. But well, the thing about que traditional quest mage is that you know what they're going to do. Hmm. So you know they win condition and you you know when you're going to die. But with with the new quest mage, you're basically you're playing around all the random stuff. So <laughs> yeah. play around, I don't know, 50 available wild Wild spells and mage. So it's, it's sometimes there's just nothing you can do, you know. Yeah, it's ridiculous. One one last question. What do you think is the most degenerate deck in the history of the wild format? <laughs> this is a hard one because well, because there have been some good decks before. You yeah, know? we speak more wild, so every deck is broken. <laughs> mm. Like Nagwa Naga Sea Witch, or maybe like Starliner, or. I don't know, Patreon uh, Warrior? Uh, it's too many to choose from. I would, maybe I would pick Reno Priest. Reno Priest, really? Yeah, Reno Priest has been very good in this prime. Yeah. Maybe it, yeah, the prime has been like a, like a year ago, so people probably forgot about it. But it's been very good. It was very good when it was in this prime. When you drop down Razan turn, turn 5 yeah. into... <laughs> Shadow Ripper and you know the game is probably over. Oh, it's done, yeah. I just, yeah. I, I even just forfeit. I concede. If I see Raza on 5, I'm just like, oh, okay, well. It was a close game. Mm -hmm. I'll that. Do you think, do you think Reno Priest still survives? Or like, Raza Priest still has a place in the meta, even though it's an underpowered hero power now? Um, it does. I mean, uh, Memnarch, I, I know that that guy will always play. Reno Priest, like he's the only player who's wow. playing Reno Priest on ladder, but he's been consistently hitting like top 20 legend. Well, even though he knows the deck in and out, but I think that if um, I would say a uh, a typical Hearthstone player to pick it up, just can still do some things. All right, man, that's awesome. Reno, it was a pleasure having you on the show. No I'm gonna let you go. I know, I know, it's getting late here on Guam. Mm -hmm. It's probably getting late there in Australia. Uh, yeah. Man, I hope you continue to do great things in the wild community. It's amazing seeing you play. And all of you guys listening at home, uh, be sure to check the Re Reno's Discord channel out um, to get more info on tournaments and Team Rank Star. And uh, give this decklist a try as well. But uh, mm -hmm. we will see you guys next time. Thank you.